Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Isham, and I would like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. Today's speaker, Emily Fort, will be presenting Bringing Order to Chaos, Science Base, and Other Project Life Cycle Tools. I'm joined by Dr. Sean Carter, who will now introduce Emily. Sean, welcome. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Fort, who's uh, the Data and Information Coordinator here at the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. At USGS, Emily is responsible for coordinating IT and data management activities among the climate science centers, the CSCs, and also our center, uh, including developing data policies and leading an information management working group. Before coming to USGS, Emily was a program manager for federal collaboration initiatives at OMB. And today she's going to be talking about bringing order to chaos, uh, science-based and other project lifecycle tools. So it's my pleasure to introduce Emily. Thanks, Sean. So we're here today to talk about what the Climate Science Centers and the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center have been doing in the arena of data management and what tools we're using, which includes science base and several other things. This grew out of a talk that Sean Carter gave a few months ago where he talked about the science and, and what the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center is all about and mentioned some of the data things that we were working on and it got a lot of questions. So I'm here to talk a little bit more. This is, covers a lot of different um, topics. So if folks have any follow-up, I'm happy to chat and any questions and um, we'll just step right through it. So. First, a little bit of an agenda. I'm just going to do a quick brief a briefing of who we are and some of our challenges and opportunities, talk about how we've approached this issue, some of the policies we've put in place, a bit about our process and sort of the big picture, dive into that big picture a little bit, talk about some integration, things that we've been working on, and, and kind of where we see things heading. And so to summarize a little bit is, you know, the initial, when I came on board a few years ago, we wanted to figure out how we could best support the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center, the CSC's data management, and provide some core tools that would support the activities that were ongoing. So just in case folks aren't familiar with our enterprise, I just wanted to do a really quick overview. So the, the Climate Science Center and the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Centers there's eight CSCs spread regionally throughout the U.S., and they're partnerships with institutions with universities. So in most cases, you'll see that there's more than one university in each region that supports the CSC in addition to the national office here in the D.C. area. So um, we have this unique um, nature where we're working with both federal organizations and universities to fund science. Some of the challenges that we faced from a, a data perspective were just some of these are really basic, obviously, is we needed to know what we were doing and where across the network. I always kind of go back to the very basic. If my boss is going to brief someone on the Hill or at OMB, he may get a question or need to know what are we doing in the area of birds or fish or um, in this particular geographic region, and that information should be easily accessible. Uh, we needed to provide just some basic capabilities and ensure there was some consistency across the enterprise. We developed some data policies and we wanted to make sure that those were being followed. And whatever we did had to provide access for both university and federal scientists. We also recognized that we were funding about 100 projects every year and that over time that number was, as it grew, it was going to be really important to have some systems and tools in place or else it was going to become pretty unmanageable. And we were a new program and growing with a pretty small staff, so we needed to work um, pretty um, innovatively to find solutions for some of these issues. So that leads to the opportunities. We did have a pretty blank slate. We were a new program, just started a few years ago, so we didn't have many of these tools. We didn't even things like a website. We had to figure out how that was going to happen. There have been more and more supportive government policies. I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with some of the open data policies coming out of the White House and the Executive Office. 
that have really enabled some of our activities in the areas of data and data sharing. <coughs> um, in addition, we also have a really supportive management team. Uh, I always sort of say that the fact that I'm merely in my position indicates some level of the importance which is placed on data management and data sharing and tools because they recognize the need to, to of someone to coordinate those activities and to make sure that, that things were happening there. And we had extensive capabilities. I mean, at USGS, at other federal agencies and universities, people were doing a lot of cool, really cool things that we wanted to take advantage of. So a few, few slides on, um, a few notes on our approach. One was just really basic. Don't build another stovepipe. I didn't see any need to build something specific for us because there were a lot of tools out there that did similar things to what we needed. So what could we leverage, what could we add to, what could we build on? We needed to provide support to the CSEs, both with tools and with people. This isn't gonna happen without some help from, from people making it happen. <coughs> we needed some policies that kind of provide some teeth to what we were trying to do. And we wanted to be able to link the projects that the Climate Science Centers and the National Center were doing to the data and the products that flowed out of those so we could understand what we were producing, where it came from, and where it might go. It was really important to use standards and web services so that we could make sure that what we were doing would be um, as open to integration and reuse and um, consistent with sort of good scientific practices as possible. <coughs> and as part of this, identify some opportunities for integration or where we might be able to link tools or, or spend just a little bit of money to add value. And we also just wanted to focus on some really core capabilities that our partners could link to, integrate, and maybe even reimagine and do something really cool with what we have started. So just a quick note, starting with the data policies, because they're the foundation to sort of what we've done, is the first thing we worked on was a data sharing policy, which was based on some other federal, similar federal policies, which basically just said the, what you do as a result of the CSC funding, <coughs> that information will be shared. And I put, unless there's a good reason not to, simply because in a few cases, for example, um, endangered species or um, perhaps some tribal activities, there may be a good reason we don't want to sh show nitty gritty data. But in general, data should be shared <laughs> that sharing needs to happen when the project is complete. No sitting on it for years and years and years and then when you're close to retirement saying, oh hey, by the way, here's this hard drive full of data. We require data management plan for all funded activities and, um, and develop some sort of, identify some common standards that we'd like to be used and of course metadata must be provided um, and that had to be a core part of what we were doing. And the link to the policies is right below. So I'm just, this is kind of a quick schematic, big picture. I'm not gonna go into one of these because I'm gonna be talking about it, but it gives you a sense of science base, which I'll dive into a little bit more detail here in a second. It's kind of at the center and a lot of things flow in and out and are connected to that. And then at the bottom, the data stewards who are the people there, we have a, one person for every climate science center <laughs> who works with the funded researchers and helps with data management, and they are really key in the underpinning to making this whole enterprise work. So first I wanted to talk a quick second about RFP Manager. Um, this is a tool we just started this past year <coughs> because we needed a way to collect and proposal information. Previously, our our directors managed this through email and the feedback was it was cumbersome, hard to manage, and, and all of the information was kind of locked in their email and getting it and rolling it up or aggregating it or from my perspective, understanding the data management plans and policies was pretty challenging. So we worked with um, the team at the Fort Collins Science Center at USGS to take an existing tool that they already had in place and we thought it would be a good jumping off point for the RFP manager. We added some capabilities and what we could pretty easily, nothing nowhere near as complicated as for example, NSF um, proposal management system. But this allowed us to um, get 
some basic information about um, who is submitting a proposal, have the review conducted through the system, be able to track who is doing what, collect things like a budget and a data management plan as well as the full proposal document, and then track which ones were um, we were going to ask, we were going to um, provide funding to. <laughs> and so one key aspect of this, at least from my perspective, is the data management plan. We ask each proposal to fill out a data management plan, and as I mentioned, we have a template that's at that site. And what we've sort of done is organize it by inputs and outputs. So every research project is taking either existing data and or collecting new data and then doing something with it to produce um, one or more outputs or products or new data sets. So for each of those inputs and outputs, there were just a few key fields that we um, needed to understand. And not all of these are required when you're submitting a proposal. We really tried to think about what we needed to know to help evaluate the proposal. And then if you were funded, we went back and asked for the full table. <coughs> but this is just some basic metadata about what they're doing. So please, brief, brief description, what sort of format is it in, um, what sort of quality checks have been done, how backup and storage, approximately how large is it, what is your, um, if there are any, the couple of key things really were if there are any issues with exclusive use, like it, it, and data sharing or restrictions on its reuse. And what we found through going through all of the DMPs from this last cycle is that there were a few cases where people said, this is data I've collected on my own time that I'm using as an input. And so that, knowing that at the beginning allowed us to ask some questions about if that would um, have any implications on sharing the results of their research or have that negotiation. The other important aspect of, I think, of collecting the data management information early on is it simply sets that expectation. So the researchers know this is something we're going to be interested in, and when we work with them and when we touch base with them as they move towards completion of their project, they're not hopefully surprised to learn that this is something that we're really interested in and that we are going to expect them to transition those products and data sets to at least a copy to the National Center for, um, for storage. <coughs> so one thing that we did as part of this whole RFP cycle, the, the Climate Science Center is a coordinated call for proposals, and the data steward team reviewed each and every data management plan. We sat down as a group and provided comments, discussed questions. We learned a lot, discovered some areas where we can continue to improve. Then we identified some you know, questions, maybe some gaps, or some things that were done really well as well, and provided those comments back to each Climate Science Center's director. And then they, the Climate Science Center directors could work with their PIs to um, answer any questions and make sure that everyone was comfortable with, with um, the plan and, and our approach moving forward. So that was really helpful and, and really raised um, our comfort level with what we're funding and what we're working with. And then at the completion of the project, the plan is for the data stewards then to work with the research team to transfer their products and their data sets to the NCCWSC repository, which is science-based, which I'll get to in just a second. So here we are. What is science-based? You guys may have heard a lot about it, or you may be really familiar with it. It's a tool that was developed um, at USGS. It's a website. It provides some data cataloging and, and data management platform for USGS scientists and partners that has a great um, search interface, it's an open source project, and um, it's more than just the CSEs. Lots of other projects, lots of other groups are using it. So why did we choose science-based? What, <coughs> what attracted us to it? Well, I mentioned earlier in the approach is that we didn't want to build another stovepipe. So science-based had several criteria that were really appealing. Um, it was very powerful. It could take lots of different types of data. It wasn't kind of built around one type of science, which is important because climate science centers do a lot of different types of science. So we needed to be able to, be able to handle everything from some biological data to climate models to, um, you know, a vulnerability assessment and everything else in between and beyond. Um, it had some core fields, but it was also extensible, so we could add to it additional fields as we needed. 
um, and we worked with the team to do that if we needed it. It was, it was very searchable. It had a geospatial component. Um, another important aspect was it was available and accessible to non-DOI users. It had permission controls. We could, you know, have everything open or we could restrict it if needed. The other, you know, blessing sort of from my perspective is um, it met all of the federal IT and security requirements. So the team at Fort Collins that manages ScienceBase and, and others at USGS, they, they get to worry about all of that stuff that, in my opinion, isn't super fun. And I just get to work with them to make sure that the tool does what we need it to do, which I really appreciate. And also it had web services built in, um, a RESTful service architecture that enabled a lot of what we wanted to do to happen. So I'm just going to walk through a little bit about different aspects of science Base to give you a little bit more detail. The first is just, as I said, finding stuff, because <coughs> science Base has everything from data sets to publications to lots of different other items as well. So there's a, a basic search, which is what you see here on the left, and you can just search by you know, keyword, you can search by tag, you can search geospatially, lots of different ways to get at it. And then there's an advanced search, which has even more detail. And also another important thing that took us some time to work out, which is how we were going to organize our information. Science Space is designed around communities, and each community has the ability to kind of design its own permissions and organization. And each community also allows for its own kind of cataloging, managing, and sharing of information. So for we knew we were organizing around projects, and we were sort of <coughs> the way we think about things are what fiscal year was that project funded. So we had each climate science center and then projects funded in a fiscal year. But then below that, we wanted we had to think a little bit about how we wanted to organize that information. And so we did it as sort of this folder structure you'll see here on the right-hand side where it says approved data sets, approved products, basis, other, and working. And what that did is it gave us kind of a designated area to put data sets, products. Basis is, for those of you that may not be familiar, it's a USGS system that USGS project information goes into. but for us, it was limited because it, it was limited to USGS only. So, but ScienceBase does harvest from BASIS. So what this allows us to do is take advantage of whatever information might be in BASIS and, not, and try to minimize any duplication, but also to be able to enhance it um, where we need to. And where there isn't a BASIS record, obviously, you know, there's no need to worry about the linking. <laughs> and you'll notice we also have this working area, which gave us a place to put things that weren't quite ready for prime time maybe some information that was still in the review process or some working documents that um, we wanted to have stored and centrally and organized together, but we weren't, you know, we didn't want out on the public web. So when you look in ScienceBase and you look at one of our project records, this is an example of what you'll see. Um, sort of organized in the central section with a description, some information on the PI, the start and end dates, and then if there's a footprint. And you can provide geospatial information in a lot of different ways. You can upload a shapefile or a geotiff or even draw a polygon using a tool with inside ScienceBase. So there's a lot of ways to kind of get that geospatial information. Then on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's an area where you can tag it in, um, with, this, with whatever keywords that might be useful. On the right-hand side, you'll see where it fits in this kind of structure. And then if, if for example, in a lot of the CSC cases, um, the, the project may be co-funded with um, an LCC, a Landscape Conservation Cooperative, so we can designate that relationship or have the same record show up in multiple communities if that's appropriate. So um, in this case, you can see that that relationship does exist. <coughs> so. Let me just back up one. So you'll see here in the upper right this Manage button. If I man click that, I'm logged in now, I'll be able to edit this record. Obviously, this is where the permissions gets really important. There's people that have edit rights, but not anyone can't come in and edit this record. So you have to have the appropriate rights. And when you do edit it, you'll see the sort of basic kind of who, what, when, where, how type of questions also an area for you to upload files, and that extensions tab is where that 
flexibility really comes into because there's a lot of extensions for custom fields. You can have one for citations. If this, if this record is related to a publication, you can have one related to um, a budget, more budget information if, if it's kind of related to a project record. So you can really customize it and add the information as you need to. And one thing we had to do with this was think about, since we wanted to be able to present this information on our website, what fields we were going to use to map to our website so that everything would show up consistently and appropriately. So that took us some time to kind of think through and work through, and of course there's always a little bit of complexity. So those were some of the initial decisions that we had. But we worked through that, <coughs> and then we took advantage of the science-based web services. So um, for those of you that are super techie, I'm sure you're well familiar with these, and for those of you that aren't, you can just think about basically this is a way to get information from one website and present it on another website through, through magic. Um, so that's basically what web services allow you to do. In this case, Science Space, again, for the techie, techie lovers, it has a REST service architecture using, it's using JSON. So for those of you that don't care, you can just ignore that, nod your head, and think about web services. So a couple of examples I'm going to dive into are our, um, the NCC WSC website, our project pages, and also a tool called Depth. So you'll see those in just a second. So this is a screenshot of the project pages, and a URL example is on the left. Um, but all of this information is on our website now. Um, it's organized by CSC and fiscal year, and it all comes automatically from ScienceBase. If we go in and we add a file to ScienceBase or we add a project record, almost instantaneously it shows up on our website. We don't have to do anything to maintain this content. So simply by maintaining our project information in ScienceBase and using those web services, we're able to present all of this on our website, which is really powerful. So here you'll see just a list of projects. And on the right-hand side, you'll see little icons. And if it has a folder icon, that means that there's some sort of product, um, like a publication or a fact sheet or a presentation or a data set. If it has the map icon, that means that there's some sort of geospatial information. So that's sort of the quick summary. And then if you click on one of those, you'll go to a detailed project. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, this is one of our examples of a project that was finished um, a couple years ago, so ago. Um, and you can see here, we can have a nice map about where the project is, um, find out some basic information about the project, who the PIs were, start and end date, um, the tags, a uh, brief description. But then we have all together, all in one place, um, everything, all the products associated with that project. So we have their fact sheet, their report, <laughs> and data. So down at the bottom you'll see data and maps. So people can come here, read about the project, read the report, and if the data is useful to them or they can reuse it, they can, they can grab that as well. So that's just an example. Um, also using web services, we did another tool called Depth. Um, <coughs> ScienceBase is very flexible and it handles lots of different types of data. And while that has a lot of good aspects, um, it isn't designed kind of around a project focus. So when you looked at that project page, it maybe wasn't presented how you would ideally want it to, to get the project information. And so what DEF has is it's strictly filtered and focused on projects. Um, there's lots of different filters here. You can filter on you know, organization, fiscal year, um, if it's a completed project or in process, who the PI, keywords, status, the project title, the other thing that we added here is um, several of our CSCs have really been focusing on trying to do regional coordination, so to understand in their region what other organizations, including other federal agencies or maybe the LCCs, were doing and how they complemented each other and, and how they could work best together. Well, this really helps promote that <laughs> because they were able to tag all of their projects with their science agenda, so we know, you know which um, which aspect of their science planning that this project supports, and you can search by that and find where, where the information exists, projects potentially spanning multiple agencies, and really understand kind of what's being done in a particular area related to their science planning. So 
I've talked a little bit about several different tools, and now I want to talk about how they're related or how they fit together. So RFP Manager, which is the tool that we use to manage the proposals and, and review the data management plans, it's really the first step in the process. And what we've done is develop a harvest that collects all the information for the funded proposals in RFP Manager and allows you with the click of a button to move those into science base. So that really helps us because you know, last year a, a poor student that I hired had to sit and go through all of our proposals and rekey all of the records into science base. It wasn't a ton of fun. It's also prone for error. So this really enables that to happen more automatically. Then we can just do a quick review and make sure when it's ready to move to the public. And then once it's in science base, that allows us to then consume those web services and make the information available on our website or in depth or anywhere else that people might be using those same services. <coughs> and you can find it via the science-based search or an integrated search tool, which I'm going to talk about in here in just a second. So another question you might be asking yourself is, okay, how does this work with other systems and other stuff? So this is a, a diagram just sort of at a high level that um, talks a little bit about that, where you have lots of different you know, data generations. There's tons of websites out there. There's tons of um, projects, and they are all feeding into um, ScienceBase, which has a set of capabilities, and then another tool, which I'll mention here in a second, the Geodata Portal, which is really spectacular at managing some large data support and some web processing services, and, and it works with a lot of, especially of our larger data sets. And then you can take information out of these and feed them into what you need them to, whether that be a, a desktop model you're running or an analysis you want to do in database in or ArcGIS or, or however you might need to work with that information. So I mentioned the Geodata Portal. I do want to highlight that. Down at the bottom you'll see there is a link. They did a webinar a few months ago that was really great and you can go and learn lots more about it. But just to highlight it, it's a tool that really helps scientists use and subset some of these really large models and data sets um, around their particular interests. So for example, um, you you need some um, climate, a climate model. Um, it's, a lot of the popular ones have been made available through the Geodata Portal and a lot of the ones we funded. Instead of having to pull it down and then figure out how to get the bit just for the area, your research area, Geodata Portal will help you do that. Um, so it's a, it's a really great tool that can help speed up the process and manage that information. We've also, um, it's standards based, which is a, a love and a theme. And it's integrated with science Base, so they can work pretty nicely together. So finally, I wanted to talk about the integrated search. This was a, a prototype that we did with science Base, the Geodata Portal, and um, a tool at the University of Idaho called the Northwest Knowledge Network. And they're one of our um, CSC universities in the Northwest. And we, we identified a common metadata standard and used um, a web service called the CSW, the Catalog Service for the Web, to allow you to go to one place, which is on our website, and search across all three catalogs at the same time. So you can find information of interest. In this case, example, the screenshot I, I searched on climate. So you can find <coughs> what might exist in that topic um, across all three, and there's an advanced search to enable you to kind of fine tune it even more. And we see this as a way to kind of acknowledge, one, that there's a lot of different places people might go for information. and, and and to sort of make it easier for people to find it by giving one common interface to get at that information. We're also looking for feedback. This is relatively new. We'd love to hear what works, what doesn't work, what you might like to be added. <coughs> so um, I showed this big picture at the beginning. I'm, I'm coming back to it because now I've talked about a lot of these items. So you can sort of see how RFP Manager flowing into science base. We're actually developing a data management plan editor that will also flow into ScienceBase and from RFP, how the information from ScienceBase flows into our website and, and depth, which actually can flow both ways because depth I didn't, I failed to mention, but it also allows you to create records there, which gives you a much more intuitive interface for creating project records. Then on the right-hand side are several of the applications that, um, that we work with. So you've got the Geodata Portal, I, I didn't touch on, but they've also developed a derivative portal, which is really cool and powerful, and then um, the integrated search, which is related to the Idaho's Northwest Knowledge Network. 
So all this is kind of floating together. And then lastly, at the bottom, we're working on a tool to <coughs> collect information on vulnerability assessments, but we're still kind of thinking about how it might be related to other things as well. So um, one question, just in case it comes up, I know several of you are from um, LCCs and you might wonder how, this, how we're working together or how things are related. Um, ScienceBase is also known by a tool, another name, um, LCMAP, and that's used a lot in the LCC community. So that's you know, the, same, the same tool, <coughs> just with um, slightly different styling and focus. But that enables that things that are developed for us can be reused by them and vice versa. Also, the team at, at the ScienceBase team at Fort Collins is part of the LCC Network's Integrated Data Management Network project. And I'm a part of that as well. So that's really looking at um, taking some of the capabilities that are part of ScienceBase and several of these other tools and, and linking them together and thinking about how we might do things better. Um, everything that we've done in ScienceBase, you know, it can be leveraged by other parts of USGS and other partners. And then both the LCC community and the CSC community have a data management working group. And, there's cross-fertilization on both of those groups, so we stay in pretty close touch about who's doing what and working together. So what did all this buy us? Was this worth the time and energy? Um, in my opinion, of course, I think it was. Uh, we provided some really core basic capabilities for the CSCs that helped the enterprise have some the basics it needed to grow and understand. It's given us a lot more um, complexity and allowed us to grow in other areas. <coughs> um, we've invested in these tools that then people can reuse and, and benefit from that value and, and grow, so that's great. Um, I think we've really got a good foundation for the program's growth and its future, and we've supported the good data management principles that we really believe in and, and that we are the foundation of what we're doing. So where do we go from here? Um, one, you know, we're, we're constantly learning. We are new and we recognize that in the first time we probably didn't get it perfect. So every time we um, do a cycle of reviews or l work with PIs, we learn where we can improve our guidance, clarify things, um, how we can walk that line between um, getting the right information from them, especially when they're submitting proposals, um, to make sure that we're understanding what they're trying to do. We want to continue to identify areas for future collaboration and integration with partners and CSC members. I'm sure there will be additional tools and features that are needed and we'll want to develop. And then we're continuing to add some features and things that we're working on right now with the science-based team are adding um, the ability to easily add digital object identifiers for all of our data sets and to improve the metadata tools and, and capabilities. And of course, as the government policies evolve and grow, we'll be staying on top of those and aligning with them. So um, that's we've reached the end, so I think I can take some questions. But first, I just want to, I couldn't do this without a lot of help. Um, I, the, the team at Fort Collins and the team at um, the Center for Integrated Data Analytics that does the Geodata Portal and Holly Padgett here in my office, we all work closely together and it helps make this happen and, and they're great and awesome to work with and also I should mention the data stewards. So I have a great group um, and I appreciate them very, very much. So I'm ready for questions, Ashley. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Emily. Great presentation. We had excellent attendance. I think at one point it was up to 133, so a lot of interest here. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going in and mining any data to produce metrics on your program. That's certainly um, one thing we want to do, Pat. Um, it's on the list, and we're still kind of thinking about exactly what some of those metrics might be, but um, that's certainly something we've talked about, and it's on the pathway as well. Okay, thanks. Then we have a... Um, Check question from Glenn, and it says, how broadly used is the RFP manager tool? Well, so we we started it. It was our kind of baby this year, and we got about 400, um, for just the CSC RFP, we got about 400 
we do it in two phases, the statement of interest and then proposals. And we got about 400 statements of interest and about 100 proposals. Um, there's already been several different groups that have learned about what we're doing, and um, the FORT team is actually working on a more generic version of RFP Manager that could be used potentially by other groups. Um, I know at USGS, I believe the Community for Data Integration has expressed some interest. Um, there have also been some super high level chats with some other groups. So I think there will be more and more just simply because it's, um, it's, it's a pretty nice little tool for kind of small, more straightforward proposal cycles. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question that says, are geodata portal records harvested into ScienceBase or do you need to use the integrated search? I'm not actually sure if they are harvested. Um, I don't think they are, but um, if Dave or anyone from Fort can answer affirmatively, um, Ashley, can they just hit star six to unmute themselves? Absolutely. So feel free to jump in, guys. I guess um, I'm going to go with no, and if that is different, um, I can get back in touch with whoever. Who asked that question? Uh, Zahia Stewart. Okay. And I'll, Actually, I'll Emily, send you. Emily, this Emily. is Dave Blodgett. I do not believe that they are because there's not an extension in ScienceBase to support the um, web service interfaces that the GeoData portal uses. Um, this is Tim Kerr. Sorry, that's 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 correct. The the uh, data data from GeoData Portal um, are not those those records are not imported uh, harvested by ScienceBase yet until uh, we have that supported. But that's um, always you know some these things can be worked out as just where they fall on the priority list. All right, and it says, um, can the LCCs individually use the RFP manager for their own RFPs? Um, I will always, well, so you would have to work with the four team and determine kind of level of support and how that was going to work, but um, technically, absolutely, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to work with you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have another one from... Josh, and it says, where is the science-based source code available? Uh, Tim or Fort Team, I'm going to defer to you guys as well for that. Hi, Josh, this is Tim Kern. Uh, there's a, um, a Git repository. There's some, um, because there's some little bit of uh, configuration involved, uh, we, we handle that, that repository right now. We uh, allow anybody who wants it can get the source code. We just ask them to register with with us. And this is Tim Kern, so uh, you can contact me or any or sciencebase at usgs.gov and request that. And could you could you just type that to all participants in the chat box? Your email address. <laughs> all right. It says. Um, we have one from Peter now, and it says, is this the new USGS data repository for all unpublished journal data that is not in another data system? There was a mention of how these would get a DOI. Um, so what we've been working on um, is, has been really funded and focused on Climate Science Center projects and funding and making sure that those items have a home, as I like to say. Um, I believe that there is a broader um, look at USGS, especially to support some of the open data initiatives and some of those calls um, to make, to look at potentially how they are, might handle or, or provide a home for, for some information that doesn't have it, um, and also to get DOIs with those activities. Um, but that that's sort of beyond beyond what we're doing. So. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure on the status of those items. 
But I believe certainly if we add, for example, the ability in science base to um, to get a DOI, I think USGS does have a relationship with a <laughs> with an organization to grant those. So once we do that and have that in science base, it would be one of those items that other groups and other activities using the tool could take advantage of. All right, and then from Ron, it says, is it possible to manage project timelines, Gantt charts, et cetera? I'm assuming that's through ScienceBase. ScienceBase doesn't have like that level of, of project support. You could, of course, upload those as attachments but um, or as files, but it doesn't have built in that kind of, those sort of project management tools. All right, and then going back to Zahi's um, question, it says, what does it take to get records harvested into ScienceBase from a local database? I think there's several different options for that. Um, I believe, again, I'm going to, because that's beyond a little bit how we've been thinking about things, um, if, if Tim wants to jump in, I believe that the team has been working on, you know, web accessible folders and, and also if there's web services, I'm sure they could look at how to make that happen, but um, you know, that would be probably a discussion that you'd have to have. Tim, I'll let you better answer that. Yeah, and again, if you have anyone who has specific questions, uh, that sciencebase at usgs.gov email address will work. But as far as getting your records harvested, Sciencebase has has a harvester interface that you set up your site for, you set up your area for harvesting, and so it's a, it's a matter of just a little bit of training to do that. It's not, really not bad. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then we do have a question of what exactly is behind the sailboat? <laughs> uh, I was trying to find something sort of zen and, and pretty to put on the last, and that's <laughs> a picture that I took on my vacation this summer um, from the San Juan Islands. I was on um, the San Juan Islands, so behind that is uh, another San Juan Island. So it's that, it's that area of the country off the coast of Washington. Excellent. Sounds like fun. All right, are there any more questions? Ashley? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask how you guys are dealing with copyright. Are you putting publications in there? Are you are you referring to science space? Yeah. Okay. Emily? Um, so generally, rather than duplicate the content, we'll try to do links whenever we can. So, you know, we'll do a, a link or a citation to um, the article. Um, if it's, of course, a federal scientist, um, some of those things are a little bit more straightforward. If it's a university scientist, you know, of course, we want to acknowledge things like copyright and make sure we're following the rules. So um, those are some details that we're still kind of nailing down exactly how best kind of writing up some best practices, but in general, we do a lot of linking. Okay. Uh, one, one more question. How do your scientists like it? How do your project chiefs deal with, with making their inputs? Um, well, so, you know, we provide a lot of support, so they don't actually have to go in themselves into science space and, and do much, although they can if they want to. Generally, they're, they're pretty busy at this point. Um, but I think, in, in general, you know, um, what we found working with the scientists, uh, you know, there's always there's some pushback. This is a bit of a new idea for some people, and and some people, um, you know, uh, have to kind of get a little comfortable with it. But by and large, actually, most people have been pretty supportive. This um, effort of of making information available and giving their work at home and being able to highlight what's really been powerful actually is what we've done with a lot of our funded scientists is go and show them <coughs> the project pages and say, look, this is going to be a place that we're going to highlight the great work that you're doing, give you an opportunity to, um, to highlight all the products and the work that you've done and you can point to that and link to it and include it um, as part of your CV and, and your um, professional career and, and they've gotten pretty excited and they like that idea of of being able to kind of have that and, and demonstrate what they've accomplished. So uh, I think it's a matter of providing those 
those incentives and helping them understand kind of the value and the big picture as well. Sounds pretty efficient. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Anita.